Welcome to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Boudis from Boudis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth building challenges involved in your financial life. Welcome back to the Agent of Wealth. This is your host, Mark Bowdis. On today's show, I brought on a special guest, Nate Lind. Nate's an entrepreneur, the author of Maximum Exit, the definitive guide for internet and technology-focused business founders, and a business broker at Website Closers, the largest marketplace of $1 million to $150 million internet technology and e-commerce businesses. Nate's here to share his expertise with our entrepreneurial listeners today. Nate, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you having me. So we have a lot of business owners as listeners, and I think they spend most of their time trying to figure out how to build up their business, grow revenues. They probably don't think much about selling the business until that time comes, and then it's probably just a whirlwind of trying to get things done. So I'm looking forward to talking about really kind of how to take a a different approach, or I guess you can call it a better approach to selling a business. But before we even get into that, how did you get started in the buying, selling, building uh, of businesses environment? Yeah, well, I was introduced to the idea of buying a business from a friend. Uh, we were looking at buying a, a supplement company, and I, I'd been, you know, very entrepreneurial through my entire life. And you know, this colleague was, you know, suggesting instead of like building something, why don't we just buy something? And I thought, well, that sounds like a smart idea. Yeah, the startup like process is a grind. Let's uh, let's see what's out there. And we found a, a supplement company that uh, we were looking to buy, sell um, a kind of a ginkgo Galoba brain focus kind of you know mental clarity supplement direct to consumers and you know we were gathered the material so the financials and offering memorandum and started doing some due diligence on the business and it wasn't looking like it was going to be easy to transfer the owner was very much front and center was an author and had a lot of other intellectual property kind of around their acumen and um, this was going to be very difficult to transfer that and then continue running the business so we ended up not going through with it I then instead went ahead and started a supplement company, <laughs> went through the grind of all that, did that for almost a decade. And through that process, I also built some technology uh, that helped me analyze the profit of e-commerce businesses. I kind of took some mortgage servicing technology because I came from the real estate and mortgage servicing space uh, in a career prior to that, applied it to e-commerce. And actually, that's what ended up uh, selling. Um, a strategic buyer approached me. Um, I had met him at a trade show, and they made an acquisition uh, in uh, kind of the niche that I was in, like around shopping cart technology, so internet shopping cart technology and CRMs. And they approached me about buying my technology. I ended up selling it to them. And so then I kind of had a little bit of a taste for buying stuff, a taste for selling stuff. Mm -hmm. I met the founders of Website Closers, Jason and Ron. Uh, They came to an event. I actually met a number of the principals of the internet brokerages that that I kind of surf in. And Jason and Ron had the most knowledge about this. I ended up buying a franchise. And uh, now I'm one of the one of the lead rain makers there at Website Closers and helping other entrepreneurs sell their business. And I, I find it fascinating that almost can, across the board, people will get to a point where they're either bored or burnt out or they have a like a passion for something else. And they may not even know what the market is for their business. So I love sharing how many buyers there are uh, that are looking for these internet niche businesses, anything internet, technology, e-commerce, digital marketing, anything around like being able to have an internet and kind of a remote business is a really hot market. Is that usually the trigger, that burnout or just not having the passion or having a passion for something else? Usually when they reach out to me, they are bored, they're burnt out, or they have a passion, like as burning passions, the three Bs, bored, burnout, mm-hmm. or burning passion for something new. And somewhere, somehow they have heard that, hey, I could sell my business. And so they're thinking about, okay, well, instead of just shutting down or moving on, let me see what my business is worth. And the very first thing that I, I typically am, am doing is a free consultation for people and talking with them about their business and then giving them a valuation of their business so they understand like how much is it worth and who are the buyers that would be interested. Interested in it. So what do you, how do you, I guess, is there data points from the business that you take and then translate that and say, okay, based off of this, your business is probably worth X or how do you, yes. what, how do you, what's the process you use to, to yeah. value it? 
No, it's a great question. There's two, there's two, two big pieces um, to a business valuation. The first is what's its cash flow over the last 12 months or trailing 12 months. And that's all revenue minus all expenses. And then we add back any owner's discretionary expenses like, yeah, maybe you took some extra flights and charged it to the business. Maybe you've got a car or something else that the business is paying for. I'll go through and look at the financials of my potential clients and put everything together in what's called a seller discretionary earnings worksheet. And I'll I'll show them how much cash flow a buyer would be taking on after the sale of the business. So that's the first piece and it requires some back and forth. And usually I need to get into uh, the financials of potential clients books and take a look around and then offer them some suggestions. A lot of consulting goes on here. I'm helping them change things around and, and maybe relabel things and stuff through the process as well. And then the second bit is about the multiple. There's about 27 factors that go into resolving what the multiple of the business is. And that's typically part of a call. I can usually ferret that out in about 45 minutes to 60 minutes and talking with the individual. And then the earnings multiplied by the multiple, that's going to be like the middle of the trading range. And I can talk a little bit about the upper end and the lower end of the trading range. And then that's when I'll have a question for the client. Is this what you're looking for? If it is, then we move to listing. And if it's not, then I usually at that point, I've given them some suggestions on what they can do to make some some improvements to their business. And then we talk again, six or 12 months later. A couple of things on that. So who's who's buying the business? Is it like how you are trying to buy that supplement business, a first time buyer, or is it these behemoth company that's coming in and, and gobbling up smaller companies or who, who's doing it's the both. majority of the, okay. It's both. They're looking for different sizes of businesses. So it, usually at this point, <clears throat> I have enough information to be able to say, okay, you're, if you're under a million dollars in trailing 12 months earnings, so you've, you've only put a million dollars or less of cash flow in your pocket. Uh, the buyers that are interested in that typically will be accredited investors or individuals who are looking for a business that might replace their day-to-day work effort. Like they're probably going to be someone more motivated to be owner operated. The businesses are probably owner operated too. We sell a ton of one man show owner operated businesses. That's probably the majority of what we sell. And I think there's a huge myth out there where people think, oh, if I don't have a big team of staff and if I don't have standard operating procedures and KPIs and, you know, I, I need to be big to sell. Not true at all. We have a ton of individual buyers that are looking for stuff with under a million dollars worth of cash flow. Our threshold at website closers, our marketplace, is, it needs to start at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of trailing twelve months earnings and up. Uh, from that, we can start to get to around a million dollars in enterprise value. That's what we would list the business for sale at. So that's kind of the first group for businesses that are earning between a million and two million dollars in trailing twelve months earnings. They're going to have individuals that are interested in it, and they'll also start to have some larger companies, financial buyers, strategic buyers that are interested in their business. And then the businesses that have $2 million or more in earnings, those individuals usually are not qualified to be able to buy those businesses. It typically ends up being private equity funds, family offices. There's what's called private equity sponsors who are individuals that then go and raise the money from capital markets to go fund the deal. You know they'll come in and take kind of an operational role. Uh, those tend to be the buyers that uh, that focus on these types of businesses. And you mentioned something before about you coming up with the value of the business, and then you know going back to the business owner and saying, "Is this what you're thinking?" And if not, these are some of the things you can improve. It. Is there like a fine line between, yeah, of course, trying to improve the value, but also maybe waiting too long to sell, um, and kind of how how what should the business owner kind of approach that or balance that those two things yeah. out? Absolutely. The best time to sell is when you don't really want to, when your business is growing, when things are effortless, when it just seems like the world is ripe for the taking. That's the best time because you can walk away from any any offer. You don't need anything. It puts you in the best negotiation situation. And also that is the type of business that buyers really want. They want effortless, growing, risk-free businesses. The buyers are assessing and putting a value on the business based on its risk. If it's lumpy or declining, or it looks like things are kind of going to hell in a handbasket, most of my buyers will say, mm, I'm going to pass. Like, or let's talk about this in six or 12 months and see how things are then. And by then, the business may not even be around. So, the best time to sell the business is when it's growing both profitably and in gross revenue. If you look at the last 12 months compared to 
the previous fiscal year and the fiscal year prior to that. If there's a trend of it going up and to the right, that is the best time to get the maximum value. And all about what I wrote my book, Maximum Value, about starts right there. And what are some examples of those things that either increase the value? I know you, you mentioned, obviously, if, if rep numbers are trending upwards, but then also what like if you, you know, you take that first glance at the business and you're like, all right, this is definitely, these things are hurting or decreasing the value. And these are some of the things that you should probably change to, to make things look better. Yeah. So the, the, the big one that's decreasing value then is, is the opposite. If it's declining in profitability, if it's not profitable, all of the multiples in lower middle market businesses of this type, what we see on our marketplace. And our marketplace is massive. We have over 100 businesses listed for sale at any one point in time. Over a, a half a billion dollars in companies are for sale right now. And across the board, across those 100 listings, and we sell two to 300 a year. For the ones that are declining in profitability, we have less than 5% close rate on those. They're really difficult to sell to the types of buyers that we have. Now, there's other buyers that they may, your, you know, the audience member might be thinking that could be interested in it, but usually those are self-listed on um, marketplaces that they get picked over pretty, pretty heavily. That's the, probably the, the biggest, um, the biggest challenge for folks is decreasing uh, the value. And then the second is not being able to communicate the value of the business with either complicated or sloppy or unpolished financial documents. If you aren't using QuickBooks or Xero or some other accounting system and you don't have like an industry standard uh, income statement and balance sheet that you can report that your numbers either, you know, monthly, annually, and then show the trends year over year, month over month, man, it's really hard for buyers to assess the value of that. It makes my work a nightmare. So those are the top two. It's it's kind of about the numbers. And people will think, well, wait a second, you know, what about my actual business itself? We sell all types of businesses. It could be an owner operator business with like one or two products that's being sold on Amazon or Shopify. Uh it could be an owner operated business that's providing some business service, like a business to business, you know, service, like a marketing agency or something like that. Those sell all the time. Frankly, it's it's whether or not they're making money and you can prove it. Right. That's the deciding factor. That's what buyers want is if it's making money and it's consistent and it's growing, they'll buy any type of business out there. Now, going back to the numbers, right? And I would think QuickBooks and, and having some pretty solid you know, income statements, balance sheets are probably square one. Does the owner have to go as far as like putting a pitch deck together, similar to seeing, you know, some private equity or things like that? Does that help? Is it not worth it to do? If they're going to self list, absolutely. You you need to go spend some time. You're oh, man, I I feel for you. If you're going to self list, it is so much work. We've got teams of writers that handle all that for our clients. We're a full service brokerage. We're also the largest marketplace of these types of businesses. So I ha literally have a team of writers that are researching industry metrics and mark you know do, creating a market overview for the the specific business niche. That's writing up the offering memorandum, and it, it ends up being like fifteen twenty pages by the time it's all said and done. But for someone who's just looking to list their business on their own, yeah, you're going to need to spend some time. You're going to learn have to learn how to create an offering memorandum. They're also called confidential informational memorandums, SIM, C-I-M for short. That's kind of the industry standard. It needs to include a summary of the business, a financial summary. It needs to have a bunch of information around the industry, the market overview, the outlook, the future of the business, the potential of the business. And it needs to talk about uh, the key selling propositions of the business. So there's, there's quite a bit of material that goes in there. And I, I do break this down in my book, too. There's a whole chapter around what our sims look like for someone who wants to take a, a stab at it themselves. Hats off to you. It's a ton of work. <laughs> I yeah, don't like I'm doing sure. it. I've got a team that does it for me. And then I, yeah. then I review it and edit it and polish it. Yeah. What, what's different about, you know, like a e-commerce or a digital uh, business than say, let's say selling like a law firm or a car dealership or something, you know, other either product or service based? Yeah. Geographic uh, availability of it, number one. So our buyers could be someone in California looking to buy a business that's anywhere in the country. And because of the nature of an internet-based business or technology-focused business, it can be operated from anywhere. So we just have a much bigger audience of buyers. And I think we've got like mm -hmm. over 167,000 buyers on our email list right now and growing mm -hmm. like 500 to 800 a week. 
versus like a law firm or something that's very geographically localized, your pool of buyers is limited to who's within 50 miles, you know, 50 or 100 miles. And uh, that's, you know, even if it's a massive metropolitan area like Los Angeles or Houston, Chicago or New York, it's still a fraction compared to the available buyers that are international because we do have a lot of international buyers too. That makes sense. Now, when you're going through the process, they actually get to the terms of the of the sale. It, what's the typical buyout? Is it someone's just going to get handed a lump sum of money? Is it spread out over a period of time? Is the owner expected to stay on and work for a certain period? What do you see like the typical structure of, of the deal look like? So this is what we call the deal structure, um, it, and it depends on how the business is set up to transfer itself, what we call how transferable is the business. If the owner-operator is working 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week, and he's integral to everything, then he's going to need to stick around for a little while, probably a year, at least 90 days, probably a year, maybe even as much as two years, depending on how integral uh, he or she is to the business. If they've delegated a lot of the work efforts, if they have a management team, team, if they've got you know folks that are able to take care of the business and it's, it's a little bit more passive for the owner, then there's much less time they need to be involved in it. But and then the counterweight to that is those businesses tend to be bigger. And then there's also an, an effect where like private equity firms, like your buyer, whoever they are, they need to understand uh, how between the seller and the buyer and, and themselves what are the missing pieces in all this? If they're not bringing anyone that's operational to run the business, then they're more inclined to say, hey, I need you to stick around for longer. It's really a case-by-case -case scenario, and it's, it's kind of difficult to give a broad answer, but I'd say that if your business is running effortlessly and you're not spending a whole lot of time in it, you've got a really good opportunity to, to go ahead and sell it without having to put or invest any more time in it. And this is something that's really important. You're not going to have to work any harder or put in more hours after selling the business than you did before the business, and you're going to more than likely have a plan with the buyer. And I would help with my clients assessing this and, and making sure this happens uh, in the transition plan for my client, the seller, to scale down, to move out and away from the operations. And most buyers know that's what a seller wants to do. They're not looking to sign up for more work. Otherwise, nothing would ever yeah, sell. Right. For the structure of the business, it, again, these are some pieces that kind of come in uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Typically, the businesses that get higher cash at closing are really, really growing. They look like risk-free. It looks like, you know, basically anybody could do this now. They, you know, continue running it. They need to make sure that certain functions of the business are being funded properly. And then the oversight of it is very minimal. And there's a leadership team involved in it as well. Like those tend to be the higher cash at closing sorts of transactions. Um, mergers and acquisitions in this lower middle market range, kind of like real estate was before 100% uh, financing became available. Uh, usually there's going to be some component of the transaction. I'm always pushing for well over 50% of the transaction in cash. I'm pushing for 80% of the transaction in cash. And my average is about 70. So we're getting about 70% of a deal in cash at closing. And then that other 30% tends to be something like seller financing, or it could be rev share. It could be holding some equity. Maybe the owner holds 30%. They sell 70%, get cash, and they hold 30% and keep and ride along for three to five more years with this new buyer with a whole lot of extra fire in their belly that's going to 10x it. That happens a lot too. And more rarely now are we seeing earnouts. Most of my sellers don't want to have anything to do with earnouts, and a lot of buyers don't. I mean, they they want to lower the risk and they want the seller to have some skin in the game after the transaction. And there needs to be a mutual commitment by seller and buyer for the business to have long term success. Otherwise, the transaction will, will just simply won't happen. Someone will feel like there's uh, something malicious or or right. nefarious going on, and, and and the deal blows up. What what about the the current market conditions and how they affect um, sales? Like for one, interest rates have gone up a lot over the past year. Does that impact valuations at all? And then also, there's this looming: is there going to be a recession? Is there how bad is a recession? Is there not going to be a recession? And are business owners thinking, okay, I'm going to accelerate it and I'm going to try and get this done before something happens, or vice versa? Are they thinking, let me just wait this out for another year or two years, and then we'll be back on strong footing again? 
We have both. We have sellers that are pushing to get deals done faster, and they recognize that you know time is you know is is not helping them right now for a variety of factors. Maybe their business has a chance of of suffering some potential you know decline in the future, and they're they're kind of pushing to to get it listed and get it sold. Again, like when somebody's bored or burnt out, or they've got a burning passion for something else, often mentally they're not in the best place to grow the business. I tend to find my my clients that are in that mode, they kind of feel like the window is now, like I want to get this thing sold and they'll move through. Regarding the valuations right now, definitely we've had an increase in capital, you know, interest costs. So when a buyer is buying a business, they have to add this additional interest to the carrying cost of the business, the debt service coverage of the business. And that does have an effect, I think, you know, not helping uh, business multiples in this exact moment. So we're Q1 of 2023 for someone who's listening to this. But it, it is not changing the number of buyers that's looking for the business. So there can, there can still be a lot of competition for really good businesses. And then that kind of has a converse effect, uh, helping multiples as well. So I'm always encouraging folks to, and I, I've got a client right now that they were just you know notified about something outside of their control with their manufacturer. It's, it's just one thing that can knock a company out. Um, you know, businesses that are reliant on any of the search engines or any marketplaces or any single manufacturer, you're one phone call away from possible shutdown. And I encourage my my potential clients to, you know, look at what's what is truly meaningful for you. Where are you headed? What are your passions in and timing wise? If you're thinking about selling more than likely, you know, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, you know, physically, you may be headed that direction. And it could be time to take a look at uh, at where you want to go and not worry so much about, you know, the immediacy of multiples and, and, and valuations because they're not going to fluctuate massively. We saw a little bit of an uptick, like maybe a year and a half or so ago. Things are not down terribly versus that. And of course, I'll assess with all my clients, like what's your exit desire? What's your exit strategy and your outcome? And I, I won't bother listing somebody that if the industry and the market and the trends and stuff right now aren't going to meet their expectations, I only get paid if the deal closes. So I'd be wasting my and their time. And I simply just don't have the time to do that. One of the concerns I see with business owners thinking about going down this path of selling their business is that they're not sure if they want to do it, yet they're worried about if they start marketing it, listing it, it may have like a negative competitive advantage. Is there a way to market a business, not a, maybe not anonymously, but like kind of without it being easily told who the, who this business is? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. So our marketplace is that shield between our sellers and our buyers. We create what's kind of called a blind teaser. Uh, we'll list like what the the industry the business is in, uh, some financial details about like its size, its age, its profitability. Uh, we'll have a very like vague summary about it, enough to wet the whistle of our buyers, and they'll reach out and express interest. And even on that initial non disclosure agreement, they still don't see the name of the company. It's not until they sign the non disclosure agreement and then I countersign it. And I have to do this with every buyer for every business I list because our agreement with our uh, our sellers are that we're only compensated on prospective buyers that we bring. Now we're also an exclusive um, marketplace as well. We I won't list a business that's that's splattered everywhere. Like, I bless you. Good luck. I'm going to be the coach of a football team that I'm going to take from the beginning of the season all the way to the Super Bowl. <laughs> I can't freelance as a coach. That's what we do is we protect our, our clients. We list with our uh, address in, in Tampa. Uh, it looks like Tampa, you know, Florida is the Mecca of Got online business trends because <laughs> we're selling two to 300 of them, you know, every year that yeah, the, the mayor of Tampa loves us. <laughs> we, do, we do all this business. We've made Tampa this, uh, this internet Mecca of uh, M&A. Yeah, we shield our, our clients from all of that. I'm doing um, a tremendous amount of vetting buyers before they ever get a chance to talk with my client as well. And there's other shields that we can put in there too. There's some specific things that are very competitive. And a lot of my clients will ask like, how do I, how can I divulge enough to get buyers, but not divulge too much that I'm, I'm revealing any secret sauce. And that's a conversation that I have with each of my clients to make sure that we're not sharing anything that is very sensitive, um, you know, upfront. We, there's, there's stages where we, release a little bit more and a little bit more. And the, the first stage is when we're reaching out to the public, uh, they have no idea what the name of the business is, where it's located. The second phase is they sign a non-disclosure. So we have a contractual agreement that they can't disclose. They can't reveal any of this anywhere. They can't use it you know, competitively. 
and then we share the financials. We'll share the right. offer memo, and then we don't share anything more until they present a, a letter of intent. At right. that point, they need to do due diligence. So we share bank statements, tax records, like that sort of stuff. And then if there's even still very specific and sensitive information, maybe about manufacturing or about marketing, we won't share that until the asset purchase agreement is drafted. And that's basically the signing of the deed right. of a house. That's when that's signed, the deal is done. So then we have to reveal everything. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. Nate, thank you for being on the show today. You gave some great info on buying and selling businesses. How best can someone reach out to you, find out more about what you do? I'm best by email, nate at websitecloser's with an S dot com. Nate at websitecloser's dot com. Perfect. We'll link to that in the show notes. Thanks again. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, don't forget to follow the Agent of Wealth on the platform you listen to and leave us a review on the show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutis Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial planning and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investments and financial planning.